Hi, I'm Bakemi Berserker and welcome to the third episode of my Let's Roll series, which focuses on the generation and progression of each core Bekmi Dungeons & Dragons character class. If you don't know what Bekmi is, I strongly recommend you watch my Bekmi playlist, link on the screen, where I dive into many aspects of the game and make the case why I think it's the greatest version of the Dungeons & Dragons game. Before I continue with exploring the generation of a Bekmi Magic user, I recommend those unfamiliar with this edition of the game to watch my first episode of this series, Exploring the Generation of a Cleric, as I use that video to introduce many rules. Moving forward, I will assume that you have watched that first video so that I do not have to repeat information. As I roll up a magic user, I will explore the character class as presented in the Rules Cyclopedia, released in 1991. Once generated, we will level up to examine how the class has progressed and what's changed. As I'm using the Rules Cyclopedia, I will be including the Skills Rules, but in this video I won't be covering the Weapon Mastery Rules. This is because we are dealing with a magic user here. However, I will do a quick example of magic item creation, as it's far more likely that a magic user will be involved in that over Weapon Mastery. Today we're going to look at generating the third character class we come across in the Rules, the Magic User. We are told that the magic user's main ability is the powers of magic. Magic users find spells and then learn them by putting them into their spell books. They study from their spell book to memorize these spells for casting. Magic users are the weakest class physically. They have on average the fewest hit points and have limited use of weaponry. Also, they cannot wear any armor. Although magic users start weak, they can become the most powerful character class. It's a long and difficult journey, but the reward is sheer power. However, those limited hit points ensure that magic users tend to be extremely cautious. Very few magic users achieve what they set out to achieve. The most precious item belonging to a magic user is their spellbook, and it contains all their knowledge. Backups can be made and kept in a safe place, but if a spellbook is lost or destroyed, replacing it is both costly and time consuming. High level magic users may build a tower and even have their own dungeon, or they may serve an advisor to a ruler or they may even continue to travel the lands, seeking ever more magic, served by a loyal group of powerful henchmen. Well, that's the basics of a magic user when starting at first level. So, let's roll. Here's the front half of my character sheet. Let's stick the important information about a magic user on the right here, so that we can refer to it as needed. The first bit of information we're told is that the magic user's prime requisite is intelligence so I would want to ensure that score is my highest to maximize the amount of experience points my character earns, as well as ensuring my magic user has a good understanding of languages. Now, what's interesting about the Beckme magic user is that there is no requirement for the character class to start with a minimum intelligence score. This is despite the rules stating that an intelligence below nine offers a rudimentary knowledge of language. For example, an intelligence of four to five means one cannot read or write, and an intelligence of three means you even have trouble speaking, meaning you're probably speaking gibberish. This seems a bit out of step with the classic image of a wise man, the very meaning of wizard. However, this has resulted in some interesting character concepts by players who have reinterpreted the use of spellbooks to be things like arcane sketches on vellum, or indeed tattoos on one's body. So the mad old hermit living in a faraway cave may not be the most intelligent of people, but wear those markings all over his body, for their meaning is beyond the ken of a rational mind. And that gibberish he's speaking? Well, it might be prudent to take cover when the guy opens his mouth. That said, a low intelligence magic user would progress much slower than others due to the XP penalty they would receive from a low prime requisite. Overall, a high intelligence is of great benefit to a magic user. Anyway, let's get back to the generation of this magic user. Let's put the dungeon master's name here and the class and the level we're going to demonstrate. As we're looking at the magic user, I'll insert some scores here that are sympathetic to that class. Okay, so now it's time to work out the bonus or penalty adjustment for each ability score. Let's get that chart on the screen. Right, so I get a minus one adjustment for my strength, but I don't intend to get into combat, so that's not a real issue for me. The adjustment for my intelligence is plus two, which will give me a 10% bonus to my XP, due to this score being my prime requisite. My wisdom gives me no bonus at all, and neither does my dexterity, so I really need to stay out of combat as I'm at real risk of being hit from an attack. 
My constitution gives me a plus one, so at least I'll get an extra hit point every level up to ninth. But what's really interesting is my charisma of 16, offering a plus two adjustment. Charisma in Beckme offers quite a bit more than what might be guessed on the surface. As we can see in the chart on the right, in addition to the plus two reaction adjustment this magic user will gain when interacting with others, the next column, labelled Max Number of Retainers, means this magic user is charismatic enough to hire and lead six people at a time. Very useful for a magic user needing some muscle. In addition, due to this high charisma, each of these six retainers will have a morale score of nine, meaning they are less likely to run away when things are getting a bit fraught. Each of these adjustments will affect my character's interaction with the world, as described by the highlighted text but this magic user is certainly shaping up to be a clever force of personality. But how many hit points do they start with? Well, looking at the information in my table, a magic user's hit dice is 1d4, the lowest in the game, indicating that being safe from attacks is the number one priority if you're trying to get a spell off. As I mentioned in my previous videos, a character does not usually get maximum hit points at first level, so I roll my 1d4 and get a two. I can add one to this roll because of my constitution adjustment, making my actual hit point total three. This magic user is very crunchy indeed. Maybe he spent too many days indoors, a bit pasty and physically underdeveloped. Let's insert the number three into the hit points box here. The next thing I need to do is add my magic user's saving throw scores to this sheet. In Beckme, saving throw scores are determined by class, as shown on this table. So all we need to do is transfer the numbers for level 1 onto my sheet. So Death Ray or Poison is 13, Magic Wands is 14, Paralysis or Turn to Stone is 13, Dragon Breath is 16, and Rod, Staff or Spell is 15. Let's now turn to Languages. As mentioned in my previous Let's Roll videos, each character starts with at least some understanding of what's referred to as the Common Tongue. As you can see on this Languages table, Due to my magic user having an intelligence of 16, they have four languages. The first two of these will be common and my magic user's alignment tongue, which I will elect to be neutral. Self-preservation is what this magic user is all about. He's there to help, but if you get yourself into a sticky situation, well, that's not his fault. For his third language, he's picked up a little elvish from his interactions with the Kalari tribe and also some goblin. He was once captured by the Wolf Skull clan whilst travelling through the Dimrak forest. He doesn't like to talk about it that much, but he now has a particularly skewed hatred of goblins that rivals the dwarves of Rockholm. So let's put these four languages on the sheet, as well as my magic user's alignment of neutral. Okay, so my magic user is almost there in terms of the front half of this sheet. The combat section at the bottom is the same for all character classes and just relates to the number needed to hit a particular armor class but my magic user has a minus one strength adjustment to hit in melee combat. Let's amend this hit roll table to account for this. Right, so let's give my magic user a name. Let's use the one from the basic red box when introducing new players to this class and call this magic user Felonius, together with the portrait offered in that set. Right, meet Felonius. He's a little aged for a new adventurer and that high charisma score shouldn't be ignored. So let's call him Felonius the Shrewd. He suffers no fools, least of all amongst those he deigns to travel with. Okay, Felonius the Shrewd is developing nicely both on paper and in my mind. Now it's time to turn over the sheet and insert some further details. Specifically information regarding Felonius's spells and the skills he knows. We'll put a list of all available magic user spells here and come back to this in a moment. A magic user is completely dependent on spells. Therefore, access to spells becomes their main driver for adventure, so that they may obtain lost magical scrolls or even the spell books of fallen magic users less fortunate than themselves. The rules state that first level magic users begin with two first level spells recorded in their spell books. These spells are usually determined by the dungeon master, but this can vary from campaign to campaign. In Beckme and most old school versions of the Dungeons and Dragons game, magic users can memorize a number of spells from what they have available that is, from the spells that they know. The number of spells that can be memorized is dependent on the magic user's level. Furthermore, once a spell is cast, it is erased from the memory of the magic user, meaning it cannot be cast again that day, rendering the magic user less effective until they are able to re-memorize their spells, which is typically done after they have been well rested, such as a night's sleep. 
when a magic user learns their spells, they may use their memorization slots to memorize a spell multiple times, meaning that they may cast the same spell more than once. But of course, this comes at the expense of not having slots available for other spells that they may have in their spellbook. In addition, if a magic user wishes to use the reversed version of a spell, such as darkness instead of light, they must have memorized the reversed version of the spell. They may not attempt to cast darkness if they had only memorized light. This is different from clerics, who may reverse spells in the moment, as needed. Checking this magic user progression table, we can see that Felonius, who is only first level, can memorize just one spell a day of the two available in his spellbook. As he progresses up the levels, this number will increase. For instance, at 10th level, he will be able to memorize 14 spells a day, consisting of three first, second, third, and fourth level spells, and two fifth level spells. The rules state that a magic user gains one known spell per level, through either their teacher or through research. Obviously, Felonius will want to be obtaining as many new spells as possible as he levels, so finding scrolls and spell books whilst adventuring is a priority in order to have a comprehensive portfolio of options. So as Felonius is only beginning at level 1, let's give him two first level spells for his spellbook. These can be Sleep, for when needing to drop a large number of enemies at once, and Read Magic, for when the deciphering of magical writings is required. I'll tick these as being known. Now let's put a nice table here to refer to so that we can track how many spells Felonius can memorize. Now I'll tick Sleep as being my single memorized spell. It's not worth choosing Read Magic right now, as it's a more scholarly spell, unlikely to be required in the heat of battle. So that's spells for now. We'll come back to them as Felonius goes up the levels. For now, let's move on to skills. I'm going to need a third page for this. Each character starts with a minimum of four skills, plus a character's intelligence adjustment. Felonius's intelligence adjustment is two, so he starts with six. An extra skill is obtained for every four levels a character gains. We'll see how this works as Felonius climbs up the levels. In the meantime, he chooses Alternate Magics, Leadership, Mysticism, and Stealth Caves. These are recorded on the sheet along with their relevant ability score values, which must be rolled equal to or under to succeed in a skill check. With his remaining two skills, he will take the language skill twice, electing Orcish and Dwarfish. Felonius wants to take advantage of that high charisma of his as much as possible. The language skills do not require skill checks, as those languages are now known, so we'll put them into the language section on the front of the sheet, here. I'm not going to delve into equipping my character or determining their wealth, as it won't really add to the information I'm trying to relay here, so let's say hello to Felonius the Shrewd, our first level magic user. An influential character who convinces others to join him on his quest for magical wonders, whilst sharing much wealth with his retainers. He becomes a popular wizard, obtaining spells from dark places and forgotten libraries. Now Felonius the Shrewd is no longer first level. He has 1,650,000 experience points and has reached 18th level. A curious choice of level to look at, but we'll get to why soon. He sits in his tower overlooking the Caves of Chaos. Why build a dungeon when you can just take one over? His eyes scan the tomes he has accumulated that line his impressive library before he turns to continue his research into his latest magical creation, whilst his other creations watch in eager anticipation. Let's have a look at Felonius' character sheet to see what's changed. First, let's look at his saving throws. As Felonius is now 18th level, we can refer to the correct numbers on this table and copy them to the sheet, like so. But it's worth noting that, for the 18 levels that Felonius has climbed, his saving throws have only improved three times. Not only are magic users vulnerable to hit point damage, but it appears they are extremely vulnerable to special attacks as well. Next, we'll update his hit roll chart, again consulting the numbers appropriate to his level and updating them on his sheet. When we account for Felonius's strength adjustment for melee, he needs a 14 and 13 to hit armor class 0, respectively. The last thing we need to update on this part of the character sheet is Felonius's hit points, by consulting the magic user's hit dice information again. As you can see, Felonius gets 1d4 hit points per level up to 9th level and he may apply his constitution adjustment to this total. However, as he is now 18th level, he does not roll a hit dice for levels 10 to 18, and he also does not get any constitution adjustments for levels 10 to 18 either. 
instead only getting plus one hit point for every level above ninth. I roll 8d4 for Felonius, adding another 8 for 8 levels worth of constitution adjustments, getting a total of 28. Adding the one hit point for each level above 9th is a further 9 hit points, making 37. Adding this to Felonius's current 3 hit points makes a grand total of 40 hit points at 18th level. Not great, necessitating the need for Felonius to surprise opponents as much as possible. Let's update the hit points on the sheet here. Now let's turn the character sheet over again and update the items there. We can see that Felonius has obtained a good number of spells through his own research and whilst adventuring. Let's go ahead and update the memorization table and check off the spells he has memorized. Ok, let's have a look at skills. Felonius gains another skill for levels 5, 9, 13 and 17, so chooses Alchemy, Ceremony, Detect Deception and Escape adding the relevant ability score total as well for the check. Now, according to the rules cyclopedia, when Felonius reached 9th level, what's also referred to as name level, he had the option of building a tower. However, in the expert set released in 1984, this option was only made available from 11th level. There's no real difference beyond this, but I just wanted to acknowledge the slight discrepancy before moving forwards. I'm dealing with geeky 36th level Beckme players here, so I'm not about to let that one go, only to be pulled up in the comments. However, we're sticking with the rules cyclopedia here, so when Felonius reached 9th level, he had several choices of career path available to him. These were to become a wizard, a magist, or a magus. A wizard is a land-owning magic user, who builds a stronghold, typically a tower, and lives independently of political affiliations. We are told that a wizard need not seek permission from a ruler to build their tower, and that it is likely that such a ruler may send lavish gifts to the magic user just to keep them sweet. No one wants an angry wizard on their doorstep. In addition, a wizard may build a dungeon that will attract monsters to both keep visitors away and also to experiment on if needed. Sometimes you just need to get your hands on a harpy claw, you know? The magist is also a land-owning magic user, but acts more as an advisor to an existing ruler. For this they receive significant payment in return, they may not do anything that is against the interest of the ruler they serve, but they may take leave to go adventuring when required. This seems the least exciting of the three options available to high-level magic users, at least in my opinion anyway, although the magist can obtain financial support for magical research, if it is in the ruler's interests. What is interesting about both the wizard and the magist is that they may attract 1d6 apprentices to serve them. Each apprentice may be up to third level, but most importantly, these apprentices offer either the wizard or the magist some form of protection, albeit relatively limited. The magus is basically a travelling magic user, one that does not elect to stay in one place, deciding a life on the road in constant search of adventure is more to their liking. The most interesting aspect to a magus is that they may attract a following of 1d6 powerful fighters and clerics, who offer to help the magus in return for pay. The rules state that these hirelings are much higher level than normal, the minimum being level 5. No maximum level is given, so it would be interesting to know how high a level you've allowed this to go in your campaigns. Do you, for example, let your wandering magi travel the world with their entourage of 15th level henchmen? That would be interesting. There is a further omission from the rules cyclopedia that appears in the companion rules with regards to the magus, and that is that the magus has a chance to come across treasure maps or rumours of powerful items. Obviously, this would be at the DM's fiat, but it could be used to foreshadow adventures and other events. I know we're sticking with the rules of Cyclopedia in this presentation, but I'll put this on the list to at least acknowledge this option as having been available. Out of these three options for a high-level magic user, Felonius elected to be a wizard. He's always been a romantic at heart, and remembers the heady days of wandering the Caves of Chaos and being frightened out of his wits. So he has built his tower overlooking the site. What's more, he's taken ownership of the caves themselves and takes a stroll now and again through its dark corridors to reminisce his early adventuring career and discuss philosophy with the local Minotaur. Now, to those that live near Felonius's tower, the wizard seems to keep himself to himself, not being seen for weeks on end, but there's always a light coming from the highest window, as well as the occasional plume of smoke, and sometimes a loud bang. As we know, Felonius is now 18th level, 
and what he's been up to in that tower is plenty of magical research. Today he's researching the end of his creation of a construct, a gargoyle to be precise. He's already made three before, each guarding one of the cardinal directions from his tower. Now he wants a fourth to finish off the set. But how is this resolved? The rules state that to create a construct, a magic user must be of at least 18th level. If a construct has up to two asterisks next to their hit dice in their monster description, then the magic user must use the Create Magical Monsters spell. What these asterisks mean is the number of special abilities a particular creature has. For the purposes of a gargoyle, it can only be hit by magic or magical weapons and is immune to both sleep and charm spells. Constructs with three or more asterisks in their description require the Create Any Monsters spell, a ninth level spell. The rules state that the required components must be obtained before creation is attempted, and that the cost of an attempt is 2,000 gold pieces per hit dice of the construct being created, plus 5,000 gold pieces for each asterisk the construct has. This amount is spent regardless of success or failure. The time it takes to create a construct is a number of days equal to the total cost in gold pieces divided by 1,000, plus one week. The magic user may not conduct any other activities during this time, such as adventuring. Once these stipulations have been met, the chance of success is equal to 2 times the magic user's intelligence score and level added together, minus the total of the construct's hit dice added to its number of asterisks. This number results in a percentage chance that must be rolled under for success. The first thing we need to be certain of is that Felonius does indeed have the Create Magical Monsters spell. And he does, as indicated here. So in the case of Felonius, the cost of constructing a gargoyle with 4 hit dice and 2 asterisks is 2,000 gold pieces times 4 plus 5,000 gold pieces times 2. So 8,000 plus 10,000 equals 18,000 gold pieces. The time he needs to spend on this project is 18,000 divided by 1,000, which is 18 days, plus 1 week. So another 7 days, totaling 25 days. So after 25 days, Felonius's chance of success is 2 times the total of his intelligence score of 17 added to his level of 18, minus the 4 hit dice of the gargoyle and its 2 asterisks. This amounts to 70 minus 6, which equals 64%. Therefore, Felonius has a 64% chance to create his fourth gargoyle. We'll assume he was successful, and now has four gargoyles perched on his tower overlooking the Caves of Chaos, and sometimes pestering fresh-faced adventurers attempting to get too close. Watching ill-equipped adventurers trying to fend off gargoyles without magical weapons is one of Felonius's favourite pastimes, and it saves having to feed all those monsters in his caves. As you can see, having a swarm of gargoyles at your back might be much safer than going through all that weapon mastery malarkey and putting yourself in unnecessary danger. Making a gargoyle takes even less time than going from skilled mastery to expert, although at much greater expense, and Felonius did have to wait until level 18 to be able to do this. Still, he's not stopping there. Making gargoyles and other strange things is what he likes to do in between adventuring, and he needs to keep his apprentices busy after all. So as the years pass, Felonius sees to the development of many an aspiring magic user, and although his small domain is a dangerous place to venture into, he's been no trouble to anyone outside of it. In fact, he's often come to the aid of the local duke to help put down numerous incursions, from within this plane and without. So now Felonius the Shrewd is 36th level. He's never been bothered about attaining immortality, as he's the creative sort and wants to leave his mark on the world he exists in. And he also wants to be remembered as the Great Wizard of the Caves of Chaos, a moniker he finds more amusing than anything else. He's given over his old tower to his apprentices, and now resides in one he magically created that floats 500 feet above the Caves of Chaos. It's not because he's paranoid, he just wanted to show off a bit. Overall, Felonius has made more friends than enemies, and there's not many men as powerful as he that can say that. So let's have a look at 36th level Felonius and admire his power. We can see that his final hit points have reached 58 enough to survive an opportunist attack and get away to fight another day. We can also see that all his saving throws have a value of 2, meaning Felonius has a 95% chance to make any saving throw. As for his hit roll chart, this hasn't progressed very much, 
as Felonius's speciality is not weapons. That said, he still only requires a 6 or a 5 to hit armor class 0 with melee or missile weapons, respectively. We can also see that Felonius has added Minotaur and Medusa to his list of known languages, which would have been required through spending skill points. We'll get to that in a moment. But let's first look at Felonius' spellbook. We can see that he knows every spell there is to know. He can also memorize 9 spells of each level each day. And that's not even taking into account what other magical wands, staves, and scrolls he might have available to him. Moving on to skills, we can see that he has acquired 4 more skill points on his way to 36th level. As I mentioned earlier, he spent 2 of these learning the Minotaur and Medusa languages. But he has also acquired Mimicry and Planar Geography. Felonius has a penchant for imitating exotic things. We've got some space to exploit here, so what we'll also record are the statistics of Felonius's magical guardians, which now include bronze golems, and we'll also stick in a map of his dungeon, the famous Caves of Chaos. I'm afraid I would have put an unpixelated version here, but my players watch this channel and I'm not about to spoil my latest game. That said, having this here is a nice reference for Felonius's player when contemplating the demise of future low-level adventurers. So there you have it, Felonius the Shrewd, Grand Wizard of the Caves of Chaos, a powerful yet charismatic man. Well, that's been an enjoyable walkthrough of the magic user. I was worried that I'd have nothing to talk about once we got past spells, but the exploration into magical research was an eye-opener into the power a magic user can access, as long as they can keep the cash flowing. How many of you have played a high-level magic user? Did you find them fun? Or did you get fed up with their vulnerability at low levels and try something else? It would be great to know. I thought the dungeon aspect was really great fun, giving me dungeon keeper vibes. Perhaps this could be an even more fun angle of the Dominion rules that could be explored and developed. That's got me thinking. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this third episode of Let's Roll. Please give it a like if you did indeed like it, and please hit the subscribe button if I've earned your future attention. If you'd like to thank me further, you can buy me a coffee, link on the screen or in the description. Otherwise, I'm Beck Me Berserker. Keep making your saving throws and I hope to see you back here soon.